our season preview podcast series rolls on Derek Young. I struggled to say it a little bit. It's not really even a tongue twister, but it still felt felt difficult. I don't know why. Yeah, I don't know why I did either. It's always nerve-wracking to start the show because you don't want to start the show the same way every time. You don't want to say, hey, welcome to the KSO show presented by Tallgrass Tap House, or it's another edition of the KSO show. Like, I, you know, I got to start it different every time. And then fresh. I push the button to hit play, I get, I get nervous. You're a little fresh. Yeah, yeah, I thought it was pretty good. It actually is, though, the KSO show presented always by Tallgrass Tap House on 320 East Points in Manhattan, Kansas. We were at Tallgrass last week with Gip and Martavius and not DY, so it was a really, really good time. Today, DY, we're talking about wide receivers as we do continue with our preview series, which runs every Saturday on KSO. And before we started recording, DY, I said to you, and I think you kind of agreed, there might not be a position that's had more go on, you know, this since spring football, at least, and in this offseason than wide receiver. I think there's quite a bit to talk about. Yeah. Uh, two guys removed from the team, two put on scholarship. And I think we also had a receiver flip over to defensive back. So Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a completely different unit than it looked like bef- before the spring started. Because, yeah, DJ R- before the spring started, DJ Rinder's wide receiver and the top two receivers most people would have guessed. Probably, Zuber and Risen. Zuber and Risen. Zuber and Risen gone. DJ Rinder, D-back, like you, a defensive back like you referenced. So significantly different. So we'll, we're going to go one by one at the players uh, – as we have done throughout this whole thing. But in general, you know, I kinda, I'll kind of start with what we usually finish with. Not necessarily having to rank the unit, but if you look at this unit, you know, in the Big 12 or just for K-State in general, how do you feel about it? Uh, it's, it's also a question mark on this team. Nothing necessarily jumps out to you that makes you think, hey, this could be top three or top four unit. But I think the biggest takeaway or something that I feel the most confident on when it comes to this position group, wide receiver, is that it will be far better once the season comes to a close than it is at the beginning. And you could probably say that for any position for any team. That just just happens over time. But at the same time, I think there's so much room for growth when it comes to the wide receiver in comparison to what you'll see across the country and even within Kansas State's own roster. And a lot of that has to become – is because – you know, I'll just say I think the starters will probably be at least on opening day. I have a feeling it could be White King Gill and Dalton Schoen, and by you know game twelve, it could be two completely other guys. That's really well said. If you just look at the scholarship breakdown, as you referenced already, two scholarships given out to walk-ons this off season, uh, both to well, one to a really young player in Philip Brooks, a redshirt freshman, another one to a junior, White King Gill. So interesting not just they gave out scholarship that's at that position but these aren't seniors you know these aren't guys that you can give it to and not worry about how it affects you know your future scholarship situation so they definitely they definitely one of them and also to your point when you talk about I could be so different you look at it you've got one two three four five six seven players on scholarship five of them are either sophomores freshmen or redshirt freshmen so five of the seven you know aren't even juniors and then your next best receiver who's not on scholarship but there's some talk of it Seth Porter is also a redshirt freshman so six of your top eight receivers are either freshmen or sophomores. So it really speaks to your point of why this unit could look very different at the end of the season. Yeah, it's uh, probably will be the toughest to determine two of their starters, but one has to think that Dalton Schoen probably has one spot penciled in and and his presence at uh, Big 12 Media Day is probably indicative of that. I think Malik Knowles is probably easily their most talented receiver, yeah. but I just think that – uh, he probably has to prove himself a little bit more with the new staff, maybe not overall in terms of skill and talent, but maybe just commitment and dedication and knowing what to do and when to do it, just being a more reliable player in general. So that's why I think maybe you match up why King Gill with Dalton Schoen. Of course, there's you know still Shabaston Taylor mm-hmm. as well, and I might even be missing another one that'll probably factor in even further. But I think it's likely that Gill and Schoen kind of run away with this job, at least at the beginning of the season. I do too. Let's assume it is those two because I think think you're, everything you said I agree with. And why King Gill was called the best receiver in the spring by Chris Kleiman pretty definitively. So if you read between some tea leaves or just read quotes, you know, and you realize you're right, Dalton Schoen was taken to Big 12 Media Days. And then at Big 12 Media Days, why King Gill was called the best receiver. That's probably the starting two. Um, we've seen these two play quite a bit. You know, Dalton Schoen's been a big part of the offense for the last few years. Wyking Gill kind of kind of off and on, but, I mean, we saw him a lot in the spring, and he got a lot of playing time kind of towards the end of the year. What does that duo give you, and what does it lack that this offense might need? I think Wyking Gill's probably a better athlete than most would, would tend to consider him as just because he started from, you know, 
a walk-on distinction. I don't think he's an incredible athlete, but pro- he's a better athlete than Dalton Schoen, and Dalton Schoen's played the last couple of seasons. But I think they're probably going to have the rules they do to start the season, and I think the number one culprit of that is they're both re- reliable. Yeah, I think that's what they're going to look for. It's going to be an offense that probably doesn't throw a lot. I think they're going to throw more than they threw at North Dakota State, but if you look back at some of their history, they were throwing sometimes as few as you know, 18, 19 passes a game. So if you're going to do that, you mentioned reliability. You're going to need guys who can catch the ball. Dalton Schoen, if we're being real, has had problems with drops, you know, at times. And I think I, you know, we heard that some of that went on during the spring too. But I still think if you're just saying, what two guys do you feel the best about being in the right place, being able to make a catch on those limited pass attempts, it's probably right now Schoen and Gill. Yeah, and that's probably why they're going to start game one. Now, you know, in a week this could change or in two weeks this could change because then the bullets really start flying and you really see what you have. And in real practices, and probably the most serious practices they've had up to this point with the new coaching staff, because uh, you have practices in the spring, and those are important, but they they don't uh, pale in comparison to to the ones you have in fall camp when you really find out what you have on your team, and in just as much or probably more than you would in the off season, of course. So uh, who knows? Maybe the light comes on for Malik Knowles. They surely need it to because he is easily the most talented guy. But at this point, reliability is being valued uh, quite a bit. And and that's why Joshua Youngblood will have a chance to you know factor in as well, because for a true freshman, he seems to be a guy that they have a lot of confidence in and feel that he's going to be reliable. We've talked about a lot of these guys. I think we've done a really good job of talking about specifically Shone and Mike King Gill. And Malik Knowles, I agree with you. I think if you're just a combination of – Size, length, speed, athleticism, playmaking, I would agree with you. I think he's the best, most talented receiver on the team. But if we're just going kind of spot by spot, we've done Schoen, the only senior scholarship player. We've done Gill, the only junior scholarship player. You've mentioned the only sophomore scholarship wide receiver, which is Tabaston Taylor. And it's interesting. Taylor had, you know, a monster statistically spring game two years ago. You weren't fooled by it, for lack of a better term. You were concerned with... You know, kind of the way he ran and his athleticism, maybe that's the wrong term, but he didn't look as explosive as you'd like at receiver, um, even despite his size. I think his body's leaned up a little bit, at least from the appearance of it. Do you think perhaps he's more ready to help now than he was a year ago? Because like I said, you were one of the guys who, who didn't really accept, expect him to play last year, even after his great spring game, and you were right. Yeah, in the fall of 2017, he didn't play a whole lot, or maybe not at all, and I think he was a freshman at the time. And he looked explosive from the little that we did see in warm-ups, but that following spring, it seemed like a lot of that had dissipated. And, and of course, everyone knows he's put on about a good 10 to 12 pounds since he got on campus. And like you said, it has leaned up. So if that explosion comes back, then I think that he's maybe a guy that could factor in at some point. But I haven't heard anything behind the scenes or seen anything in front of my own eyes to suggest that he's taken a big leap yet. But... Uh, that would be a welcome sight if he did, for sure, because they're going to need someone that can provide a little bit of playmaking that perhaps Schoen and Gill cannot. And if uh, Knowles isn't ready, then you know, then they might need to look to Shabaston Taylor to provide that, or obviously go to the true freshman route. But I, for lack of a better term, I, I just don't think that Taylor is ready just yet to have that kind of spotlight. I feel the same. I know there's some some posters on our board and informed posters who have heard good things about, you know, Trebaston Taylor this this spring and this off season. They may well, may, may well be right, but something we never do. I don't think as you know as as journalists, whatever, we don't say stuff we haven't heard. And so we have I have not heard about Trebaston Taylor standing out necessarily this off season. Doesn't mean it's not true, but I can't sit here and say that I've that I've heard it. Yeah, I mean, Coach Kleiman, he's went out of his way to talk about the skill and talent that Malik Knowles has had. Yep. Uh, the leadership and just everything that Dalton Schoen provides that Viking Gill is, you know, was the best uh, receiver they had throughout yep. spring football. And it may not have been that close. He, he brought up Joshua young, but a true freshman Unprompted, unpro- yeah. unprovoked. Um, he's talked about Phil Brooke before even, I think, yep. and Seth Porter. So he's not afraid to just throw out names, even if unprovoked. And I'm not sure we've heard him mention the likes of a Shabaston Taylor just yet. I don't think I have. I think obviously when we start getting a chance pretty soon, you know, have press availabilities again and be able to find out more about that kind of thing. But yeah, I think if, like I said, with, with the Dalton show and occasional drops thing, if we're being real, we haven't heard a lot about Shabaston Taylor. Doesn't mean he's not performing well. Doesn't mean that kind of stuff, but we can't tell you we've heard anything truly unique. You know, you bring, you bring up Phillip Brooks, 
I, he was out of the guys who've gone on scholarship. I'm not saying he doesn't deserve it. I, in fact, I think he probably does considering the situation at receiver and in the return game. But I was a little bit, I was probably most surprised. I expected, you know, Wyking Gill. We expected Devin Anktel, I think. Adam Harder, not yet, but these guys we kind of expected. Um, Philip Brooks surprised me a little bit. And, and maybe most part because he's a redshirt freshman. That's, and there's no guarantee you have to keep him for four years. I know that. But in theory, this is the guy you're looking at and saying he's he's worth a four-year scholarship. And both Philip Brooks and Malik Knowles, the two redshirt freshmen, both played last year for K-State. Yeah, and Brooks actually played more than Malik Knowles, so a lot of that uh, – uh, at least in the return game. Yeah, yeah, most of that decision probably comes from that. He played in all four games, and then he wasn't necessarily held back. And he played mostly the return game. There was a few snaps on offense here and there, not as much as Knowles on offense, a lot in the return game. So a lot of it probably came from that and the fact that he was drawing interest uh, from other Power 5 schools right. in terms of being a scholarship player, I think, because he is a guy that – while not as fast as Seth Porter, probably has a lot more wiggle, and he he's been you know complimented on his wiggle. I think that that role is probably going to be a battle between Brooks and Porter, and one's on scholarship, one's not, and probably because of circumstance more than anything at this point. But there's probably not room for both of them to have the kind of role that they want. Right. So that'll be interesting. And I'm this is totally speculation, but it's something I kind of think, and you kind of said it too. I I think those two were seen as very similar in in K State's eyes. I think one of them made it, you know, relatively clear and did have legitimate other Power Five opportunities to where if he didn't get them, he may he may leave. Where I think, you know, Seth Porter is, is probably even more of an impression that, you know, hey, I'm at I'm at K State no matter what. You know, a bit of a legacy for him at K State too. And you're right, very similar players, both redshirt freshmen, both smallish. I think you described it perfectly. I should just let you talk because you're really smart. But I think Porter, um, probably well from a 40 yard dash perspective is faster, you know, than Phillip Brooks. The times that we saw from this off season, Echo Boydo was the fastest at four, three, eight second fastest on the team was Seth Porter at four, four, three, but you're right. It's not just about straight line speed and Phillip Brooks, we understand has better lateral movement. And those are probably the two top options right now we would see in the return game. I know this is a receiver thing, but yeah, Brooks and Porter, probably the two top options in the return game. Yeah. One would, one would think um, with Marcus Hayes not eligible. Yeah, with Hayes not eligible, the return game is probably something we know the least about outside. No doubt of them probably resorting to playing Philip Brooks there because of the role that he had a year ago. But uh, offensively, I think that they they probably do like both. We've heard good things out of Porter and Brooks as a scholarship, and they just won't wouldn't throw that to a four year player if they didn't have to, of course, and especially not someone that would just be a returner. So I think that there's room for one of those two to have a role as a wide receiver on this team, at least in some capacity, but it would be tough for both of them to. We're about to cover the redshirt freshman. It's going to be a true freshman K-State has on the roster at receiver and then talk a little bit about recruiting. Before we get that, though, I do want to, again, mention our sponsors. It's not just Tallgrass Tap House. It's also Harry's and Bourbon and Baker, which are also both on points. And if you're listening to this and not subscribing to our site yet, I mean, that's okay, but but I wish you would. Um, I think uh, I think it's going to be a really exciting football season to follow. And there's a lot of stuff you just don't see, you know, behind, you know, the paywalls, cliche as that sounds. Um, a lot of people on the message board who know just as much as we do or not, if not more, and are able to share a lot of those things that we can't. So I think you, you see the front page of the site and you think, well, that's all the value in it. And I think that's some of it, but it really is a lot more behind the scenes, D.Y. Yeah, our, our message board is uh, generates, I think, a lot of our traffic and – that's where we have probably, I would say, the largest and best community when it comes to Kansas State sports. And uh, a lot of people participate. In it, and I think it's not just fun for the posters. It's fun for, for guys like us, too. And we you know, monitor and manage that side of the business quite a bit as well. So it takes a lot of our time. And we hope that yep. you in, invest in that. And it's valuable. And I'm going to stop selling our website here in a second. But even if you just lurk. I mean, I was on this message board for the last – my whole life you know i mean of internet fandom um before this and i i can say i wasn't somebody who posted the last 10 years before i took kso over so yeah just reading it i think sometimes is is entertainment enough but i'll get us back to wide receiver we've talked a decent about joshua joshua youngblood but let's kind of finish up some thoughts on him he's gonna play i mean I, it would be absolutely shocking to me if he does not at this point and you talk about how different the receiving core could look week 12 or even week 8 9 10 i think one of the biggest changes we could see from now to then would be Joshua Youngblood's place in the pecking order at wide receiver. Yeah, and I would imagine his role is going to be similar to the one that was owned by Darius Shepard at North Dakota State. And, and Darius Shepard is an NFL contract right now uh, with the Green Bay Packers, so it's something that definitely translates to the next level. That the, and they're going to sell it, you know, when they're on the recruiting trail. 
But I think that's where Youngblood's role is going to be. I think that's how he's going to play. And I and that you know stands to reason. Is he going to be a guy that's in the two wide receiver sets? He might be. We probably don't. The little the part that we don't know when it comes to him is what kind of wide receiver he is. Right. But I wonder if he's that like that number three lurking guy like Darius Shepard kind of was. And I know Shepard was in, a, in on two wide receiver sets too, but he was more of their slot guy that they used, right. um, you know, in different ways. And I think that's probably what Youngblood is. So, um, And that's another role where, you know, as much as they, they like a Seth Porter or a Phillip Brooks, uh, as little as they throw, and, some, and they average under 20 passes per game at North Dakota State in some seasons, um, is there going to be enough balls to suit a guy that's right. maybe – fifth down the line and that's Porter or Brooke. So that that's where a little bit of, I have a little bit of trepidation on, on how guys like that, how much of a role they're going to actually play, because I don't think that they're going to overtake someone like Joshua Youngblood and they're probably going to be similar players. The last but not least, you know, true freshman last scholarship player is Keenan Garber. I'm still a big Keenan Garber fan. I say still because you know, although he was rated higher than Youngblood, we're hearing a lot more Youngblood hype. And if we're being honest, I think Youngblood is much more likely to play at receiver this year than Keenan Garber. But Keenan Garber, again, just going to be a true freshman, has a lot of career ahead of him. One of the more explosive guys probably on the team already. It's just going to be, can he add enough size quick enough to really contribute a wide receiver early in his career? Yeah, I think he's probably a very likely redshirt candidate just because he probably doesn't have the size to compete right away at the Power 5 level. Maybe he gets in a couple games at the end of the year and still yeah. maintains a red shirt. I think that is like very possible. If we're talking about a position change, I don't think that's likely. Um, I wouldn't rule it out, but I think he's still solidly a wide receiver. I know there was at one point. You so know, said there was he, a time when we wondered if he was a corner. Yeah, you know, kind of there stuff. was some yeah. belief even on, on my part that he might be a corner, but I think that he's going to be a wide receiver. He's number one. I don't know if they'd give him that. They didn't think he was going to make some plays offensively. It's oh, a, you forgot. Number one's yeah, back. Number one's back on offense to a true freshman. I, I like Ian Garber. I think the the arrow is still pointed upward, but yeah. he's probably just starting from a lower point than young blood. Right. And exactly. I almost want to get ahead of the, you know, mm -hmm. What's wrong with Keenan Garver stuff? And I don't say that to make fun of people saying it, even though I said it in a, in a making fun voice. But it's one of these situations where this guy's a true freshman and he's going to have a peer who I think, and we both think, is probably going to get on the field a little bit. And that's going to lead, you know, to some questions about how's Keenan Garver doing. Uh, we've heard nothing concerning about him. He's a fantastic athlete. But yes, I'm with you. I think if he plays, it's going to be more like a one or two, three game thing, not a thing where maybe like, like Youngblood where it could be a guy they're really using in their offense. Yeah, Youngblood's just more physically ready at this right, point. Right, right. Let's talk recruiting for just a few minutes, and correct me if I'm wrong, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but to me, I mean, I read every recruiting thing you write because I have to, you know, because it's my job. Um, I think wide receiver's the one we've seen the fewest real names at, you know. Even O-Tackle, which gets a lot of hype for not going great, we've looked, we've, you've given us 100 names for it we've talked about. And it's not like you haven't received too. I bet if you really want to be nitpicky, there's probably 10 or 15 you've given us. But I feel like out of all the positions, that's the one maybe we talk about the least, and I'm personally the least clear on what their targets are beyond the commitment of Jalen Travis. I think that's fair, and I think... I think the names and the targets are probably more comparable than what you or I understand or the listeners understand. I get, I think it's more of a product that they might get the fewest bites at receiver because they're probably only going to add two in my estimation, perhaps a third if it's someone that they just can't turn away, if it's the best player available kind of uh, situation towards the end of the class. But at the – at the end of the day, I think they're only going to add two. They already have one. And I, unlike other positions, I don't think people are knocking down the doors to be right. a wide receiver in this offense. I don't think that they're going to struggle immensely to find a receivers in this offense. I mean, they got a, they, they produced an NFL wide receiver in North Dakota right. State. Now you can say after Darius Shepard signed his contract. But at the same time, it's not going to be a sexy – a position to sell it's not going to be a sexy team to buy into as a wide receiver especially when you look around the league and the big 12 is kind of known for wide receivers i think 
we've talked a lot when it comes to recruiting about K-State needing to prove some things, you know, to recruits, whether it's that Chris Kleiman can win at the FBS level or, or whatever it is. There's probably not a single position where they more need to show somebody, you know what I'm saying? Hey, this is what we can do with you at this spot than wide receiver because of everything you just said on paper and in reality too, if you look at it, Every other these old schools running four and five wide, they're throwing it 40 or 50 times, and you see K-State with two throwing it 20 times. But if they have a scenario where they can show, uh, just going to throw some out here, that whoever their number one guy is, let's say it's Malik Knowles, is the number one guy this year, and he ends up with 80 catches for 900 yards or whatever. If they can show that, hey, if you're still the guy, we're going to have great numbers, then maybe it becomes a little more sexy is the word you used. But I agree, until they show that, it's going to be the toughest position to sell, probably in recruiting. Yeah, it'll probably always be. And it probably always will be. Yeah. Position to sell, and as much as Malik Knowles having a thousand yard season would help, I, I don't know how much that will actually move the needle. Because what's going to be strange about it, and I know it's going to be hard, maybe for our listener to understand, and I'm not talking down to them because I, I think I know you it, are. I know it doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but the problem is, if you're a wide receiver. You, opportunity is what you're looking to here uh, like all if anyone wants is an opportunity and a team that only plays an, on average two wide receivers per snap in comparison to a team that plays on average four wide receivers per snap you have a better chance of seeing the field when the other team is putting four wide receivers right. on the field right and that's what you're kind of playing the odds when you're a high school recruit. You're like, do I want to roll? You're kind of rolling the dice a little bit by joining the team that's only going to put two on the field at the same time on average because that limits your opportunity a little bit. I think the best way, and and K-State can combat that, we'll have to see if it plays out this way too, would be if you're just doing the math. And let's say you can go to K-State where they play two receivers and throw it 20 times a game. Or go to Texas Tech where they play five receivers about 50. That's still 10 receptions, 10 targets a game per receiver. The problem, though, is you're only putting two on the field instead of four. So what I'm getting at is if K-State really is only going to carry seven or eight scholarship receivers, which is pretty low, if they can do that, only carry seven or eight and, you know, get 10 targets per receiver – and Tex carrying 16 and playing four at a time, you could say, do the math. You have every bit the same chance to play receiver at K-State as you do at Texas Tech. But they've got to show that. You know what I mean? And I think even still with that kind of sales pitch, even though mathematically it may be accurate, it's, it's going to be hard. It's going to be tough to sell somebody on <laughs> That's that, a I tough think. selling point. And we're kind of... Uh I wouldn't say we're being hypocritical, but we're all, we're also forgetting something that we already said on a prior podcast, or or maybe on a future podcast. I'm not sure. Tight end, sure, prior. of course, yeah. So, I mean, because we talked about the high percentage of throws to the, the tight end. The point I'm trying to make is K State's not going to sit there and say we're not going to recruit wide receivers. Yep. So if you're going to come up with a pitch, I think the two things you want to be able to sell is we can put guys in the NFL. Whether well, you're pointing to North Dakota State or if Malik Knowles has a big year, and you can also point, hey, you know, target per receiver on the field is the same. Those things may not be totally accurate, but you're going to have to sell something, and those are the best two things I can come up with. Yep, but they, that, that's what I that's how, that's how you have to attack it. And with all this being said, they're, today's Wednesday the thirtieth, right? Thirty first. Wednesday the thirty first, yeah. or is it Thursday? It's Wednesday. It's Wednesday the thirty first. I think I've looked at this today. Let me pull. Up the yeah, when here. you don't have like a regular- Wednesday, July thirty one. You're listening to this on. <laughs> Saturday, whatever that is, August. But today, as we record this, it's Wednesday, July 31st. Without a football season going on and with our jobs that aren't necessarily 9 to 5, it's really hard to keep track of days. So, rough. But that's good. Wednesday the 31st. So as we're talking now, I don't know when you're, you're going to hear this in a couple of days. They would all have just hosted a really good, highly recruited wide receiver in Connor O'Toole. Saturday, August 3rd. Yeah. That's when from, they're hearing this. Yeah, so five days ago or four days ago, three three days ago, actually, uh, yeah, they just had a Connor O'Toole on campus, and he's someone that you know has offers from plenty of Power 5 programs. Nebraska's one, so that's someone that they're in the mix for, and he, they had him on campus. The good news is, too, because of what, we, what we've talked about, they don't need a bunch at receiver. If they were fortunate enough to take Travis and, and Connor O'Toole, for example, they would probably be done at that spot, Derek, would you say? Especially considering they've given a scholarship to another redshirt freshman and have another redshirt freshman they're at least thinking about with. And things can always change. They can find some people they love through senior tape or whatever, but you think it's possible they take as few as two at this spot? Yeah, they could just take two. It just depends. Yeah, if there's a guy that they can't, they don't think they can live without, they'll take him. But two is their comfort zone. Three is not too much for him, though. We're going to roll on this series next with the offensive line, so come back next Saturday. We're going to record it right now, though, but come back next Saturday. Listen to us talk about the offensive line. We're going to go really in-depth with that one and talk about the difference between guards and tackles. Unfortunately, 
I'll tell you a little secret. We actually recorded that last week and our mic didn't work, but you've learned some stuff about some guys playing tackle and that kind of thing since we recorded it. So it's going to be better now anyway, D.Y. Yeah, better product. There we go. Better product. Thank you for listening. Please go to Tallgrass and please tell your friends.